All right, letting in now. Last. <laughs> Sean's on here too. Hi, my name is Amy Sullivan. I'm the Vice President-Elect of AAAR, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 17th in our monthly series of as and lectures. This is a new initiative for AAAR being supported by the Freelander Memorial Fund. So with these lectures, we hope to be able to highlight the amazing research happening in our community, tie our journal to other activities, and also give us an opportunity to all get together outside of the annual conference. So each month, the editors of AST select high impact okay. journal articles to be presented um, by their authors. One, These lectures are being recorded and will be hosted to AAAR's YouTube channel, which you can access from the AAAR webpage under the events tab. In addition, by one of our student chapters. Oh. And so I want to thank everyone who has helped to make these possible and all of you you for joining us. And with oh. that, I will turn it over to one of our newest yeah. student chapters from the University of Arizona to get us started. Thanks. Well, all right. No. Thank you, Amy. Right well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for making time to join today's Triple AR lecture hosted by the University of Arizona. My name is Evelu Edwards, and I'm the president for the Triple AR student chapter here at the university. And I will be joined today by two of our members, Kayla McCauley and Kira Zider, who will be helping facilitate the Q&A discussions later on in today's session. And so I have the great pleasure of introducing our distinguished speaker, Dr. Paul Dabish. Dr. Dabish received a BS in crop sciences from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a PhD in pharmacology from the Tulane University School of Medicine. Dr. Davish is currently the Chief Scientist in Aerobiology at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's National Biodefense Analysis and Countermeasure Center, which is located in Frederick, Maryland. His research focuses on factors affecting aerosol transmission of infectious diseases, inhalation toxicology, and the development of animal models of inhalational disease to assess the efficacy of medical countermeasures. Today, Dr. Davish will be talking to us about the transmissibility of different variants of SARS coronavirus 2, which is the virus we all know responsible for COVID 19. So, from all of us at the University of Arizona and Triple AR, we want to warmly welcome you, Dr. Davish, and thank you for taking the time to join us and share your highly impactful research with all of us. Thank you and welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and, and I'd like to thank you and, the, and Amy for inviting me to speak here about, about the paper we published recently. Um, and so, yeah, as she said, I'm Paul Davish. I'm the chief scientist in aerobiology at the NBAC. So she spit out the full acronym. We say NBAC for short. We're a, a Department of Homeland Security lab, US Department of Homeland Security lab. Um, let me see, there we go. Did that slide flip okay? Can you give me a thumbs up or a, okay, thank you. So before I get going, yeah, um, as I mentioned, we're a US government lab. So anything I say is, is my own opinion and not necessarily to be taken as the opinion of the US government. Um, I just have to say that up front. So before I get into the meat of, of the research that I'm gonna talk about, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on what NBAC is, because um, I feel like there's probably a lot of people on the phone who have never heard of the lab. There's people inside of DHS who don't even know who the lab, where the lab is. And so we're located in Frederick, Maryland. So it's about an hour, hour and a half Northwest of Washington, DC. It's a small little city in the foothills of the Appalachian mountains. 
Um, our lab is shown there. It's a relatively new lab. It was commissioned in 2012, so about 10 years old at this point. Um, and, and the mission of the lab is stated here, and it's basically to characterize the threat posed by biological agents to inform risk assessments performed by the government, as well as to provide bioforensic analysis um, for biocrime incidents. And so as part of that mission, then we're broken down into two centers within the NBAC. And so there's the National Bioforensic Analysis Center. So that is the component that obviously deals with bioforensics that is funded by the FBI. It's an operational component. If there's a ricin letter, for example, sent to the president, it comes here for analysis. They do all the fingerprint analysis. They identify the material in the letter. Um, and, and so that all happens here. I sit in what's called the National Biological Threat Characterization Center, um, which is the other half of the lab. And we focus mainly on characterizing the threat posed by biolog biological agents. So we'll perform laboratory studies to inform you know, risk assessments, and in my case, related to aerosol transmission of pathogens. So what I'm gonna talk about today is um, some of the work we've done related to SARS-CoV-2, so the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, and so I think a lot of this intro will be obvious to everybody, but I'll, I'll go through it. So, you know, over the course of the pandemic, there have been numerous more transmissible variants of the virus that have emerged. And you see that in the timeline that, that's shown here. This is from a nice review in the journal Viruses that came out um, earlier last year. Um, one of the things we've been interested in, interested in here at our lab is understanding what are the differences between these different variants that may contribute to the observed differences in transmissibility. And that's going to be sort of the focus of what I'm going to talk about today is some of those studies that we've done related to that. And so transmission of the virus can occur via res respiratory aerosols. I think that's pretty well established at this at this point. And here I'm just showing a schematic of what this process looks like. And so respiratory transmission begins here on the left with generation of particles from the respiratory tract, specifically from the fluids lining the respiratory tract. So this could be, you know, for example, during coughing or could just be during quiet breathing. We know that that produces particles due to the collapse and reopening of airways deep in the lung. After those particles leave the respiratory tract, the water present in those particles will fairly rapidly evaporate. And so you have this change in particle size that occurs in the first few seconds after evaporation. Once those particles have equilibrated with the ambient environment, they are then transported throughout the environment where other people could potentially breathe them in. And if there's infectious virus present, um, there's the potential for transmission of disease um, in that way. And so if you think about this, changes in this pathway have the potential to affect transmission. So for example, if you had two variants of the virus that had differences in the amount of virus that was shed um, from the respiratory tract in a person, that would subsequently affect the amount of virus um, exhaled and subsequently affect the potential for transmission down, downstream in this pathway. Similarly, similarly, if you had changes in how stable um, a variant of the virus was in the environment, that would also alter the probability of somebody coming into contact with infectious virus. And then finally, over here on the far right, um, if you had changes in the infectivity of the virus, so the ability of the virus to actually cause infection in a naive, naive or I mean, even in this case, subsequently exposed host, um, that obviously has implications for transmission or transmission potential. So today I'm going to talk about different parts of this pathway and some of the work we've done to try to tease out which components of this pathway um, may be influencing transmissibility observed between different variants of the virus. Uh, I should have popped that up a minute ago. That's what I just said. So I'm going to start here, though, on equilibration of exhaled particles, because this is really the focus of the paper that I was initially asked to talk about today. So it's been known for quite a while, um, all the way back to the 1950s and maybe a little bit before that, that microorganisms contained in an evaporating droplet can be damaged or killed during that process of evaporation. And there's a number of mechanisms that I'm not really going to get into that are potentially contributing to the damage. Um, and that's an ongoing area of research for a number of labs, I know. Um, however, relating this to respiratory transmission, then you have this initial rapid evaporation of a particle that occurs immediately after it's ex exhaled. That evaporation then has the potential to damage any pathogens present. 
And so that, that's sort of the basis for our study. And what we wanted to look at was whether there were losses in infectivity um, of different SARS-CoV-2 variants during rapid evaporation of aerosol particles and whether there were differences between variants uh, in, in those losses that would be suggestive of differential or increased survival for one variant over another, which would then subsequently suggest that that may be a factor contributing to greater or lesser transmissibility as the case may be. And so in order to evaluate this, um, we needed to generate an aerosol. So I'm gonna go through the methods here now. So in our study, we used this small aerosol nozzle. You can see it pictured here to ge generate um, aerosol containing the virus. So this nozzle puts out an initial droplet size distribution with the volume median diameter around six microns. So we measured that with our in-house, um, with our phase Doppler system that we have. Um, you can see the particle size statistics there. The nice thing about this nozzle is that the feed rate is relatively low. So it's 50 microliters a minute. So you don't really need that much material to be generating aerosols with this. If you let that then evaporate, so you know, it'll evaporate down to some final size. And in this case, that, that size has a mass median aerodynamic diameter around a micron and a half or so. Um, you can see the number median diameter there too. But the important thing here, I think, is that size is similar to the size that has been reported for particles generated during quiet breathing. So we're sort of in the right size range, I think, and there, and there may be particle size effects associated here, but we're trying to generate something that's representative of what you would expect um, in an exhalation event um, during breathing or maybe quiet talking. And so that aerosol then is generated into a plenum, which is located for those of you who have not worked inside a biocontainment laboratory before, um, th this is our test system, which I'll go through here in a minute, but that is then located inside what's called a class three biosafety cabinet. So this is essentially a giant glove box that is sealed to some standard set by the American Glove Box Society. So a, a, a really good engineering control to prevent exposure to, to any virus which may get out of this test system. So we're generating the aerosol into this, this plenum. It's temperature and humidity controlled. We're keeping the temperature sort of at room temperature and we're keeping the humidity low in order to aid in evaporation of those particles. The aerosol is generated. It flows down this, this jacketed plenum here where it evaporates. And then at the far end, we're sampling it in a couple of different ways. We have an aerodynamic particle sizer to look at the size distribution. And we also have a couple of 25 millimeter Teflon filters to collect the virus, which we then subsequently resuspend and use that resuspended material to assay how much infected virus is present still. So in the study that was published, we looked at three different viral isolates. And so you see those listed here. So I have what's called the prototype isolate. So I'm gonna to refer to this probably after, from here after as Washington one, the Washington one isolate. So this was um, an isolate of the virus from January, 2020. This is one of the first cases in the United States. It was from an oral pharyngeal swab from a patient that showed up in Washington state with respiratory illness and they had recently traveled to China um, and to the Wuhan region. And so this, this is pretty close to the original virus. And then we also had um, isolates of the Delta and the Omicron variants. And you can see um, the isolate names there. I'm not gonna get into to where those came from really. These all came from uh, BEI resources. So this is in the US, there's the National Institutes of Health. This is their repository for biological materials. And so we have a pretty close relationship with NIAID here in the US. NIAID is the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. We sit right next door to one of their labs. Um, they were helpful in acquiring this material for us. Um, and the nice thing about getting it from this repository is that it's what you would call well characterized. So we know the sequence data of the virus, we know the titer, we know we know all sorts of things that they've done um, to, to qu qualify the virus basically. And so they sent that to us as a frozen stock. It remained frozen until we used it, we thawed it, and then we used it in the aerosol generator. We didn't passage it anymore. So this was the original stock um, that they grew up and sequenced. And then you can see the titer shown here. And so I'm gonna run through this on the next slide, but the, the units here are TCID50 for short or the median tissue culture infectious dose. And so that's a measure of the infectivity of the virus and typically on a log scale, but I'll get to that on the next slide. And so just for those of you who may have never been exposed to this unit before. So what, what this is, is basically, you're looking at the ability of 
a sample containing the virus to kill cells. And so you might have, you know, in our case, we have a filter, but this could be anything. It could be the stock. You have some suspension containing the virus. And then you have a 96 well plate with what are called Vero cells on the bottom. And so Vero cells are kidney cells that were isolated, oh geez, in the 1960s maybe, um, from an African green monkey. And so they're known to be susceptible to a number of viruses and you, they can be infected and they can be killed by the virus. And so you'll take your viral suspension and you'll put it undiluted across the top well. And then in subsequent, or top row of wells, sorry. And in subsequent rows, you'll add dilutions of the virus and then you'll look at those for what's called cytopathic effect. And that's basically morphological changes in the cells um, in response to infection. And so that's cytopathic effect or CPE, you'll see it abbreviated in the literature often. And so if you have a lot of virus, like in this case, the entire first row of that undiluted virus, all of those cells will be infected. And you look at this under a microscope and you can very obviously see whether they're infected. You know, you have changes in the way they look. And you begin to dilute that down. And at some point, you'll get to a point where not all of the cells are infected. Um, and so the point at where you, where you only get half of the cells infected is called the tissue culture, the median tissue culture infectious dose. So that's, that's that dilution right there. And you figure that out mathematically. You don't need to have a row where half of them are, are infected. There's different ways to do you know, probate analysis or things to estimate what that is. And so at that dilution, you have enough virus in there that there is a 50% probability of infecting an, um, a well. And so what that means is then in that initial stock, since we had a dilute in this case, 10 to the fourth to get there, if you back calculate that initial stock, the material in that initial well there had 10 to the fourth TCID50 in it. And that's the measure um, of infectivity that's, that's pretty commonly used um, in the field to quantify viral infectivity. So that's, that's sort of what that means. Um, one thing to note, and I pointed this out on the last slide, the output of a microtitration assay is typically log normally distributed. And so you'll see these values typically represented as log values. So you'll see log 10 TCID 50, like I had on the previous slide, for example. Okay, so now that's the assay for assessing viral infectivity. So now in our test system, um, I want to talk through the calculation about how we calculate losses or um, during evaporation and some of the meat of the paper, really. So we're generating an aerosol from the nozzle I showed you. So we start with the total amount of, of virus that we aerosolize. So that's simply um, the calculation you see here. So the feed rate to the nozzle times the duration that we spray for, so that's how many mils you put out, times the viral infectivity, so in this case, TCID 50 per mil, and that tells you how many total TCID 50 I sprayed out of the nozzle. And so in a sampler downstream, assuming all of the virus survives, the amount we would expect to see in that sampler is the amount of virus aerosolized, which is what I just calculated up there, times the fraction of the total airflow that was collected by that sampler. So in our system, you know, we're flowing at 55 liters a minute, the sampler is collecting five liters a minute of that. And so, you know, you'd expect to see 1 11th of the total amount um, sampled in the virus, assuming it's homogeneously distributed throughout the system, and we think it is. Um, and then times the physical efficiency of the system. So you're spraying down that, that plenum I showed you, you're losing some to the walls and things. And we, we estimate that value ahead of time using a fluorescent tracer embedded in the, um, in the viral media. And so we have that number. And so that tells you how much infectious virus you would expect to see then in the sampler if everything remained infectious throughout that whole transit period. And so what we're interested in though, is how much of that infectivity is lost. And so that's, that's simply the difference then between um, the amount expected in the sample, which is right there, and the amount we actually measure in the sampler. So we take the filter sampler that we did, we resuspend that it using media and vortexing, and then we run it through the microtitration assay, like I showed you on the previous slide, and that'll tell us how much we actually collected. And so the difference between those is how much you lost. And so when we do this, um, this is looking at Washington One, and this is Washington One in two different media. So from NIH, we got the virus in EMM with 2% fetal bovine serum present. So that's basically protein to help the cell microtitration assay. Um, 
We typically use um, a media with a little bit higher concentration of FPS in it and a couple of different constituents. So we compared the two just to see if that protein level affected anything. And it doesn't, um, these aren't significantly different. But what you see here is the dotted line represents zero difference. So that would mean that we're picking up everything that we expect to pick up, but we're not. So we're losing about half a log of material. So that's you know 60% um, loss or so. So we're picking up you know 31% um, of, of what we expect to. So that, that suggests we're not getting all the infectious virus back. And remember, this is normalizing for physical losses in the system. So it's not that we're physically losing it, it's that it's no longer infectious. And so when we compare that though to the Delta and the Omicron variants, the hypothesis was that, you know, if these two variants survived that evaporation process better, that you would see less loss here. And potentially that's then one of the potential mechanisms responsible for the increased transmissibility of these variants. But you can see here that that loss is about the same. And so we didn't see any difference between the isolates. Um, it was, the p-value was 0.35 there. The average loss across all of them was about 61%, like I said. So you're losing about two thirds of the virus during that initial evaporation that occurs in the first you know, 10 seconds or so. Um, and and I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that's known, it's been known for a while other, with other microorganisms. There was a paper that came out in PNAS um, from the University of Bristol um, Henry Oswin was the first author, and they reported similar results, and they did their study in a, in a pretty different way. They used an electrodynamic balance to trap particles, hold them for a period of time, and collect them while they evaporated, and using that, you know, pretty different method, they got almost exactly the same number. I think the number they report is 58% or something like that. So that, that was good. We corroborated their study. Um, they used different variants than we did, so that sort of you know, strengthens the argument that there aren't any differences between a lot of these variants as variants of the virus, which is good. Um, one additional thing we did. So to confirm that the observed losses that we were seeing were occurring dur during particle evaporation and were not due to some sort of stress associated with the aerosol generation process. So that liquid is passing through the nozzle. You and being atomized by an airstream that's supplied to the nozzle. So to be sure there wasn't some stress associated with that process that was responsible for the loss, we did another set of tests where we placed the nozzle sort of inverted into this Teflon impinger. Um, so in the bottom of the impinger, there, there's 10 mils of collection media, so viral media. The nozzle's inverted. Um, we spray through the nozzle and collect the output of the nozzle directly on the wall right at the liquid surface there. Um, in order to try to minimize the effects of evaporation. So basically we're trying to collect it before any evaporation has occurred. And so when you do this, um, there's no difference that you see between the measured and the expected amount of virus. So that's these black dots here. So we're spraying you know, some amount of virus into um, that Teflon impinger and we collect it all back essentially. So that's the black dots zero difference between measured and expected, we're getting everything back in an infectious state. If you do the same thing with fluorescein, uh, fluorescent tracer, you get 100% back as well. So it's physically 100% efficient. And in this case, we'd say biologically, we're getting it all back. And so there's no difference between the isolates. So it's pooled here. So this is all, all, all three of the isolates that we looked at um, pooled together. Um, and so there was no difference in the pre-evaporation, if you compare that to the pooled values um, that we got post-evaporation, so that would be from the plenum, you can see, you know, they average about a half log. These two are significantly different from one another. And so what, what that means is, um, or suggests is that the losses are occurring during that evaporative phase and not during some stress associated with that breakup of the, the suspension into those aerosol particles. And so we collect everything there if we catch it pre-evaporation and then post-evaporation is where we see the loss. So that suggests that it's happening during that transit and evaporative period. So that suggests what, what I have here then that, you know, in increased survival of more recent variants as a potential mechanism explaining their increased transmissibility doesn't seem to really be a contributing factor. Um, I wanna switch focus slightly and, and, to, and to talk about the implications of this evaporative loss though, you know, getting, getting away from the differences in variants. Um, 
So that there weren't any differences between the variants, but there still is this loss of infectivity that occurs with particle evaporation. So you're losing 60% in the first few seconds, right? Um, so what does this um, loss mean for transmission? It suggests potentially that there's more infectious virus near an, infect near an infected individual before that evaporation completes or happens as opposed to further away after the evaporation has occurred. And so just gonna illustrate this idea here a little bit and talk through some of the considerations here. So in this case, you have you know, two individuals next to a person, you know, putting out particles who's infected. Um, individual A is potentially exposed to more infectious virus than individual B because A, they're closer to the source, so the aerosol is more concentrated, and B, that loss of infectivity during evaporation has not yet occurred if, if you were close enough um, to that person. So, I have exposed highlighted there because there are some other considerations that we need to think about before we can say that that person is um, at a greater risk. So that they, they may have been exposed to more virus, but there are a few things we got to think about. So first of all, does the dose or the amount of virus that you're exposed to actually change the probability of infection? So is, is there some dose dependence to this response? And I, it, our, we've done a few studies, which I'll come to later, and there have been other studies in the literature which have demonstrated that, you know, for SARS-2, um, the probability of infection is probably dose dependent. So if you inhale more virus, you're more likely to be infected. I think that's known for lots of things. That's not anything surprising, but, you know, we have data to support that idea. The second thing here um, is that the probability of infection for a lot of microorganisms um, is known to be dependent on the particle size. And so... Um, that particle size influences where the particles actually deposit in the respiratory tract. And generally for larger particles that will then tend to deposit in the upper respiratory tract, the infectious dose is significantly greater. Um, this is likely due at least partially to a lot of the protective mechanisms that exist in the upper respiratory tract. So, you know, the respiratory epithelium is lined with mucus, which is cleared by the cilia and constantly replaced by the goblet cells that are present. And so you have this protective mechanism that exists to keep, you know, inhaled particulates from actually coming into contact with the respiratory epithelium. Um, and so, so that's one possibility there. Um, what we don't, and, and we know um, that the particle size has to be larger pre-evaporation. And so this, this would suggest then potentially that that could be a factor influencing the hazard associated with this scenario. So what we don't know though, is, is the infectious dose of SARS-2 influenced by particle size. And so we performed a second study. This will be published soon in the Journal of Aerosol Medicine and Pulmonary Drug Delivery. We're just finalizing the last couple of comments. Um, but this is a study where we looked at this. And so we used a golden Syrian hamster model of COVID-19. So this is a, a pretty well accepted and utilized uh, model of COVID-19 in a small rodent at this point. And we generated two different aerosol particle sizes. So about one micron using the aerosol nozzle I showed you before and about five microns, which would be expected to deposit in a hamster, most of the material into the upper respiratory tract. And then we looked at um, different metrics of infectivity in, in these animals. So things like weight loss, decreased activity on running wheels, viral shedding and oral swabs and development of an antibody response in the animals. And so for each size then, and you can see it here on the slide, we used multiple dose groups. So covered a range of doses and had eight animals per group. And so the goal here was to get dose response relationships and compare them as a function of particle size. And so this is, um, the, the very high level results here. So what you have on the left here is um, inhaled dose on a log scale in TCIB50 versus what I'm showing here is the probability of seroconversion. And so that's, that's basically the development of an antibody response in the animals. And so what you can see, if you look at that, the small particle exposed groups are the black squares and the large particle exposed groups are the gray circles. And if you, you know, extrapolate or, or draw a line over the, the median dose to induce seroconversion in these animals is approximately 30 fold lower um, for the small particle exposed group than the large particle exposed group. So what that means is for a large particle aerosol, you need to inhale 30 times more virus to have the same probability of infection. 
And so that does suggest that particle size plays a role here. Um, if you look at viral shedding, um, you see the same thing. It actually, the data line up almost exactly on top of the data for seroconversion. So you need to inhale a lot more virus to induce viral shedding in these animals in oral swabs. Um, we also have some data, and this will be in the paper, that the disease severity may be influenced by the particle size. So at the same dose, um, animals that were exposed to small particle aerosols had greater decreases in their activity. So we were measuring that with a running wheel quantitatively. They had decreased weight gain um, and, and some other things like that. So um, that suggests that the particle size in this case is an important factor when you're considering uh, probability of infection. And so coming back to this scenario here where you have you know, exhaled particles that have more virus because they haven't evaporated, um, yes, that person may be exposed to more virus, but you also have to consider the particle size and it's, it's larger, so it's gonna potentially deposit in the upper respiratory tract and the infectious dose may be significantly greater. So this is probably an oversimplification, but if you think about it, you're losing 60% of the virus going from the initial person out to point B when it evaporates. And so person A may be exposed to that full dose of virus because you don't lose that 60%. But if the infectious dose is say 30 fold greater, then the hazard for person A may actually be lower than the person than person B. Um, but we need to know some other information to be able to make that assessment though. So that was just sort of for illustrative, person, illustrative purposes. So the other things we really need to know are what is this particle size pre-evaporation that, that is coming out? So either during quiet breathing or during speaking. And, and there are some data in the literature, but I don't, yeah, I, I think that's an area where, you know, I don't think I have a good answer for that question. We know there are lots of studies that have shown after those particles equilibrate what the particle size is. Um, but it, I think it's more difficult to measure that initial particle size. And so we would need to know what that is in order to be able to map it to deposition in the respiratory tract and, and, and um, as to whether that matters or not. And then the second part you see down there is how, how does this dose response relationship in a hamster translate to humans? So that's a pretty big question. You know, there's a 30 fold difference between those two particle sizes. However, five microns in a human isn't gonna deposit solely in the upper respiratory tract. Five microns will sort of spread through most of the respiratory tract in humans actually. Um, and so we need to be able to translate that hamster data to human data. And I don't think we're quite there yet. So that's another sort of outstanding question related to this. But conceptually, um, I think the idea is valid that, you know, yes, there may be more exposure in person A, but we need to understand some more things to be able to say whether they're in a more hazardous situation or not. Okay, so that sort of covers this equilibration piece. Um, here. So in the last maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to cover these last two parts here. So transport of equilibrated particles and then inhalation of particles. Um, so we had published another paper in 2021. This is in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, where we compared decay rates of different viral isolates in these equilibrated particles then. So we do this using an environmentally controlled rotating drum chamber where we can change the temperature, the humidity, and, and illuminate it with simulated sunlight. Um, and basically what we saw is we, we looked at Washington one, that earlier one, and then B117, this is on the, on the WHO classification, this would be called alpha, um, <clears throat> and looked at the difference between those two variants um, and, and a couple other isolates from around the same time to see if there were significant differences in their stability under indoor conditions, there were not. And then in the presence of simulated sunlight. So alpha versus Washington one were the same in simulated sunlight. The other two isos we looked at might have been a hair more stable. It actually came up significant. Um, but there, there weren't any huge differences between any of those isolates that would suggest that there were, you know, that, that stability in equilibrated particles was driving um, differences in transmissibility. Now, keep in mind that that is for earlier isolates and we don't have data for more recent variants, at least that I'm aware of, so Delta and Omicron and things. But I think it should be noted that the decay rates that we're measuring in these equilibrated aerosols, especially under indoor conditions are already really low. So, you know, one to 2% per minute, which when you're talking about short range transmission is not very fast at all. Even in the presence of simulated sunlight, it's 30 to 40% per minute, something like that. 
for really short range transmission, I'm not sure that that even matters. I mean, if you think about that, about how far aerosol particles can transport in a minute, say. Um, but, and, and so I guess the point is that, you know, if Omicron and Delta were even, were, were more stable than that one to 2% per minute, so they had zero decay rate, I don't think that's really likely to cause an appreciable change in the potential for short range transmission. So I, I don't think um, that, differences in the, the stability in these equilibrated particles is really driving differences in transmission either. And so I've kind of updated that previous statement now just to say, instead of during evaporation, just to say increased environmental stability of SARS-CoV-2 and aerosols doesn't really appear to be, you know, the driving factor behind this increased transmissibility um, observed with more recent variants. One interesting thing though that did show up in the literature um, last summer was on surfaces. And so this is um, the paper you see here on the left where they, this was a research letter um, from emerging infectious diseases and they had reported data for the ancestral strain. So similar to our Washington one that I'm talking about and Omicron. Um, and they had put it in table form on a bunch of different surfaces and different, different matrices. Um, and they had a table in there. I regraphed some of it on the right. So this is looking at a, I think it's a five microliter droplet of virus on polypropylene over a bunch of days. And they looked at, you know, decay over a much longer period than we do in these aerosol studies. Typically we're in an aerosol study, we're looking over an hour or two. Um, in this case, they had it on there for a week. But you can see here a pretty clear difference in the slope between um, the ancestral strain. So the slope is steeper, that's the gray circles and then the, the slope of the line for Omicron. And so that decay rate for Omicron is significantly lower than it was for the ancestral strain, which suggests that Omicron appears to be more stable than the ancestral strain on surfaces. So, okay. Um, and I think, you know, th this has the potential to influence tra transmission via contaminated surfaces then. Surfaces then, I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, but it's kind of, in my mind, difficult to say how much of an effect or how large of an effect this is going to have on transmission or, or disease dynamics in the environment without really knowing the relative contributions of fomite spread versus aerosol transmission and, and knowing what percent of cases are due to which. And I think that's still another outstanding knowledge gap um, sort of related to this. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about transport of equilibrated particles. The last few minutes, I'm going to talk about um, differences in infectivity and whether these could be responsible for um, the increased transmissibility observed with some of these more recent variants. And so <clears throat> to assess this, we have performed another study. This was funded by NIAID here in the US um, over the last year and a half. And the, these two studies have been published down below in PLOS Pathogens and um, Journal of Aerosol Medicine. Down below, um, we compared the in infectivity and the viral shedding of different variants of SARS-2. So here we have the prototype virus again, so that Washington one, and then we have the gamma variant. So the gamma variant emerged in 2021, early 2021, maybe December 2020 in Brazil or Japan. And so this is an isolate of that. At the time when we started these studies, this is what um, NIAID was interested in looking at. This was about the same time that Delta emerged and they had someone else working on Delta and we were asked to work on Gamma. And so that's why we were, we picked that because it wasn't clear which one would sort of outcompete the other at that point. Um, but, you know, Gamma, Gamma sort of fizzled and Delta took over. But it does illustrate the point um, in the study aim there, which was to compare the infectivity. And so it, in this study, we were using cinnamogus macaque. So this is a non-human primate model of disease, and they were exposed to aerosolized virus. So Washington 1 or gamma. And then we followed them over time, and we measured a whole bunch of different uh, metrics of disease over time. And so you know, we looked at the exhaled breath, both the particle counts, the size distribution, as well as the presence of infectious virus over time post-exposure. We got nasal pharyngeal and oral pharyngeal swabs to look for infectious virus and viral RNA. These animals had telemetry devices implanted so we could monitor body temperature in real time. And then we also got periodic blood draws from them to look for the presence of antibodies, as well as changes in, in hematology and serum chemistry that may be indicative of, of disease, as well as the presence of cytokines and, and any sort of transcriptomic changes that may occur. So 
I didn't say this on the previous slide, the, the aerosol we were exposing them to here was small particles. So this was using the, the that small air assist nozzle generates an MMAD around a micron and a half. This is what that deposition pattern looks like in the respiratory tract of a non-human primate then. So what you see here is an overlay of um, a CT scan and a PET scan. So on the left, you have a CT scan to look at the anatomy of the animals. And this, this was done in conjunction with NIAID and the NIH, the clinical center. They have a center for infectious disease imaging. Um, and so we worked with them to do this study. We generated the aerosol with viral media, but it was radio labeled. Um, so it had um, fluorodeoxyglucose present in it. So you could pick it up on a PET scan, which is what you see then on the right as sort of the, um, the, the colors in the lungs and, and the trachea there. Um, and so from that, you can then zoom in and, and quantify this. And what you end up seeing for this particle size, at least, you know, half of that deposited materials in the pulmonary region. So large airways, small airways. Um, some of it's in the trachea and some of it's in the oral nasal space. So it's basically sort of smeared throughout the respiratory tract. We know it is making it to the very small airways and down into the region of gas exchange because it's fluorodeoxyglucose, it'll dissolve in the bloodstream and you see it start to show up in the bladder, which tells you that it's getting down to those, those wells, um, well perfused regions of the lung where the alveoli are. And so in this study then, um, I'm just putting this up there in case people haven't seen it before, when you express a dose in these types of studies, there's a couple ways to do it. And unfortunately they have the same units because of the way they get calculated, but inhaled dose is often thrown out there. And that's simply the concentration of the infectious virus in the air. So in the exposure system times the volume of that air that's inhaled, and that would be, the dose would be in TCID 50. Um, and then you also have deposited dose. So that's simply the inhaled dose times the fraction of um, that aerosol that actually deposits. So something that comes into contact with the respiratory epithelium and gets deposited somewhere. And so we're calculating deposited doses in this study um, to calculate the deposition fraction. We're using a, a software package here called the multiple path particle dosimetry model. And it requires all of those sorts of parameters you see there in order to estimate the deposition fraction in the animals. And in this case, for the size in a, in a monkey of the size we're using, that's about 20% um, of, of the inhaled material actually deposits in the respiratory tract. And similar to the guinea pig study or the hamster study, sorry, I mentioned earlier, we expose these animals to a, a whole range of different doses because we're trying to look at the dose response relationship. And so that's just an example of the range of doses. It spans four orders of magnitude um, there on the right. And so one of the first things we looked at that I'm gonna present about is seroconversion. So the presence of antibodies in the blood. So to do this, we use something called a plaque reduction neutralization test. I won't get into this in excruciating detail, but basically what you're doing is you're mixing virus. So stock of virus with a serum sample or a dilution of a serum sample collected from the animals. And then you're putting that onto a plate with cells and looking for um, the ability of that sample to kill the cells. And that's quantified using plaques. Um, so a little plaque is a zone of clearing essentially on the cells where a, a virion has infected and started to spread and kill the cells. So in your control sample, you won't have mixed any serum in and you'll have a whole bunch of plaques. And what you're looking for is a reduction in those number of plaques as you mix it with serum. And that reduction indicates the presence of neutralization in the serum. So um, you can run that on all the animals and, and say whether they have neutralizing titers present. Um, and so the titer is essentially just the dilution of serum uh, that results in a certain percent reduction in the number of plaques. And that's typically either a 50% reduction or an 80% reduction in the number of plaques. But if you treat that in sort of a binary way and saying yes or no, an animal had a neutralizing titer at the end of the, the observation period, so 21 days after exposure, and you take that data, you can fit a dose response curve to it, and you see two dose response curves here, the top one for Washington 1, so that prototype virus, and the bottom for gamma. You can see that if you go and look at the median dose required to cause seroconversion, they're significantly different. So they're approximately 20-fold different. And so this shows that gamma induces, as it says there, the neutralizing antibody response at lower doses than um, the Washington one, that, that prototype virus. Similarly, if you look at viral shedding, so this is the probability then, what you're seeing here on the y-axis is the probability of a nasal swab at any point 
during the post-exposure periods, that's 21 days, that was positive for viral RNA or infectious virus. So, you know, we're treating it as a binary variable saying, yes, they were positive at some point. Um, and you compare those infectious doses or the, the median dose to induce basically shedding. And you can see, again, you see this, this big difference. And so this is approximately 50 fold difference. So same order of magnitude, but again, the dose required for gamma to induce um, shedding is, is significantly lower than that of Washington one, sorry. And so, you know, that, that sort of feeds into this idea that newer viral variants may have lower infectious doses, which would then increase the potential for transmission. And so it looks like that is a possibility um, based on the data from these two, these two variants in, in non-human primates. So I mentioned we also looked at fever. And so this is just an example of what those data look like. So on the top here, just as an example, you have temperature. So this is in degrees centigrade over time, so to out to 22 days or 21 days post-exposure. And you can see, you know, the temperature, there's a diurnal pattern to this. So it goes up during the day and down at night when the animals are sleeping. So this is an animal exposed to, to you know, this dose here, so two logs, um, never developed a fever. So you can see this nice sort of sinusoidal diurnal pattern that just stays there the whole time. Um, you see a couple of dips here and there, that's anesthesia events typically where the body temperature has changed. So they're anesthetized to get blood or something. Um, here is an example of what the fever looks like from one of these animals. So these are healthy young adults in amalgus macaques. So there's nothing wrong with them. And so you get a fever. Um, the fever is very transient. You can see that here on the bottom. The average fever duration or the median fever duration is, is measured in you know, less than 10 hours in, in all cases. Um, it's very reproducible. It tends to show up you know, for both variants at about you know, a day and a half post exposure. Um, and, and the median doses to induce fever are actually not significantly different than one another. Um, so you see that here, there's about a threefold difference there, but it doesn't come up statistically different. So the dose to induce fever is similar. And so now if we look at those responses for fever and overlay that with the response for a positive nasal swab in this case, but it could be any of the other curves I showed you. For Washington one, if you look at those, that dose response curve for fever is basically on top of the dose response curve to induce nasal shedding um, in fact, of infectious virus. And so you see those two curves aren't different than each other, they're right on top of each other. With gamma, you see here's the dose response curve for fever, so similar to Washington one, but that dose response curve for shedding in nasal swabs has shifted to the left significantly. And so um, you have this difference then between shedding and symptomatic disease, which we would say maybe is, is fever in these animals. That's really one of the only symptoms of disease that they get, signs and symptoms. Um, so, you know, this sort of suggests that there may be a greater potential for asymptomatic spread in the case of gamma in these monkeys. And so, you know, they, they're shedding virus before they develop any sort of disease that may you know, cause them to stop moving around or not feel well or anything like that. So, you know, if you translate that to humans, um, you can see where that would would potentially increase the transmissibility of something if you have increased the potential for asymptomatic spread. So I think that's also a possibility. Um, and then the last thing here was the exhaled breath. So I'll just talk through this, this real quick. So when the animals were anesthetized to get blood draws, we also put an oral nasal mask on them um, to collect exhaled breath for 10 minutes. So they were lightly anesthetized, so we couldn't really go any longer than that. Um, and we did this every other day for 14 days. The mask was operated at a slightly positive pressure, which I'll show you why in a minute. Um, oops, sorry, and, and here we go, is the, the animal room has a really high background of, of particles present. So you have these animals in there, there's a lot of dander. You can see that, you know, this is across 36 different measurements in the room when we did these measurements and it, it's got you know, 5,000 particles per liter of air on average measured with an APS. Um, and so to prevent infiltration of those particles into the mask, um, we ran the whole system at about plus 0.1 inches water column. And so when you do that, here is then the particle count this time, not on a log scale, but in, in the room background. And then this is in the sealed mask where, you know, we don't have um, it open to the room and you can see that count goes to zero. So we're not getting any infiltration into the mask. If you unseal the mask, you pull everything into the, the system pretty perfectly. Um, which is good because we want the particles to be able to transport through that system. But 
if we put it at a slight positive pressure, we can keep them all out, which gives us some confidence that if we see any particles in the system, they're coming from the monkey and not from the room. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we also pulled a filter sample off of the mask. So part of that flow went to the APS, which was counting particles, and the other half went to a filter sampler. So for gamma infected animals, there were four of the 21 animals where we actually picked up material on the filter. And so we were just doing PCR. We never saw infectious virus on them. Um, but you can calculate, you know, an output rate. So something around 10 to the fifth RNA copies permitted in the animals on the samples where they were positive, And that seemed to be pretty consistent. Um, the particles, if you look at the APS from those samples, they were all small, all less than five microns. So this is small particles being exhaled, which is kind of expected given that the animals are anesthetized and breathing kind of lightly. You don't expect a lot of big particles to be coming out because they're not very active. And then if you look at Washington one, you know, we see one out of 16, there, there's, you know, one out of 16 versus four out of 21, that's, that's a hard statistic to, to play with, but you do see it in both. Um, and that, yeah, so you, you do see it exhaled virus. Um, we looked at particle counts. So this is looking at the animals that were positive for viral RNA and the exhaled breath. Um, and this is total particle emission rate. There had been some data in the literature that suggested that on days when people were shedding, the particle counts may go up. Um, we don't see that. This is pretty constant over time. So this is particle emission rate, number of particles per minute versus day post-exposure in animals that were shedding. Um, and, and you don't see any real trend there or anything. This is just to show, you know, we did occasionally have animals. I said they were quietly breathing. And so you get very, in some cases, you get very few particles. And you can see here, in some cases, you're not picking up, you know, any, any at all in some of these samples. Um, and we thought, well, is the transport efficiency through the system good? And, you know, occasionally we'd have an animal sneeze or move their mouth or something, and you get this huge burst of particles. And you can see this goes up to from, you know, down around five per liter of air up to a thousand suddenly when the animal sneezes. And then you can see the size distribution associated with that over here. So we do think the system is able to detect higher concentrations just fine. Um, it's just that we're not seeing them. And part of that is that the animals are anesthetized. As I said, if you could do this from an awake animal, you might get um, better counts and you might get better resolution on this. Okay, so I'll just summarize really quickly. And so, um, and then take some questions. So this, this is the first part of the talk that transport um, through the environment, it doesn't look like increased environmental stability is a major factor contributing to increases in transmissibility for more recent variants. Um, on the infection side here, the probability of infection is, is dose dependent. Um, and there are, and, and that suggests what you see here on the right, that there's differences in exposure dose may be a factor influencing disease presentation in humans. Remember I showed that, you know, fever occurs at higher doses than some of the other endpoints that we looked at. And so that suggests that, you know, minimizing your exposure dose may minimize the severity of your disease. So that, you know, implicates masking and spacing and all sorts of things that could be useful for that. Um, the infectious dose does look like it's dependent on particle size. And like I said, there's probably data out in the literature for a dozen other microorganisms that show exactly the same thing. So this isn't really expected. TB has the same sort of response. Large particles are less infectious than small particles. So that's also, you know, it's, it's good to know for SARS too, but it's not completely unexpected. Um, the median doses for the development of neutralizing titers and shedding were lower for gamma than for Washington one. So that suggests what you see here is that um, increased probabilities of infection and shedding at lower doses may be a factor that's you know helping to explain the increased transmissibility observed with more recent variants. So you don't need to inhale as much gamma to cause the effect as you do for Washington one, given everything else is equal, right? And then finally, you know, there's a greater difference between the median doses for infection or shedding and fever for gamma relative to Washington one. So remember Washington one, the fever and the shedding curves were on top of each other, but those were separated for gamma. And so that suggests that there may be this greater potential for asymptomatic spread for some of the more recent variants, but that I mean, requires a little more digging, honestly. This is one study in, in primates, but I think that's an interesting idea if it does pan out. And then the last thing here, um, for anyone on here, and maybe there's postdocs or grad students or anyone else, we're actually hiring in our group. And so I'm just gonna put this little pitch in at the end here. Um, 
There's our website. If you go to bnbi.org and look at the careers tab there, you'll see the positions we have open, or you can get my email off of one of the papers and, and email me if you have questions or you want to talk. Um, yeah, just, just shoot me a message. And so I think that's the last slide. And so with that, I will uh, stop and, and take some questions here if there are any. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Nabish, so much for your time and presenting such fascinating research. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Kira and Kayla for facilitating the Q&A for today's session. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Kira, and I'm going to be one of the two people uh, helping with the Q&A session today. So uh, there is uh, already a question in the chat. So I'm just going to start by reading that question. And then if anyone else has questions, you can either put them in the chat and we'll get to them sequentially, or you can raise your hand if you actually want to speak over Zoom. So I'm just going to start with Don Milton's question. And he asked, could the difference uh, be attributed to evapor or could the difference attributed to evaporation be due to difference between impinger and filter collection? Paul, I don't know if you could hear me uh, when I just asked the question in the chat. Ah, sorry, I was muted and I started answering that. Oh, question. that is okay. So I'll try to, <laughs> I'll try to re, re, re say what I said. So yes, Don, absolutely. I think we, we call that out in the paper too, that you know there could be sampler stresses associated with the filter that it's not really possible to separate that from the evaporation easily. I think we'd probably go back if we could do it again and and, use the same sampler. So we'd probably use an impinger on the um, plenum system and that would sort of you know, help normalize for that. But absolutely, that's a possibility. There's a, another question in the chat. Um, Francisco asks, what are good virus surrogates to use instead of COVID? Yeah, that's a, I don't know, that, that's a, <laughs> I'm not going to suggest anything. That's a, um, I don't know. There's a lot of discussion around that, and, and you know, there's a, there's a lot of other coronaviruses out there. I suppose you would expect them um, to behave similarly, but you know, bridging data is always nice. So having somebody who's taken an infectious virus and characterized it side by side with what you want to use as a surrogate to show that, you know, you get similar losses and for whatever endpoint you're looking at. Um, uh, would be good. And so, yeah, I, I'm not going to name anything. Um, and I know there's a lot of discussion around this. So I'm sorry, that's not a great answer, but yeah, I, I don't really have a great answer for that. All right, and we have another question, and this is from uh, Jenny Lorenzo. And she first says, thank you for the talk. And then she says, uh, what about the sizes and exposure to the virus? Is that about how inhalable the particles are, or is that something else about the virus uh, that changes with smaller particles? Yeah, so that, I think there's a couple things that could be going on there. I sort of alluded to, you know, the upper respiratory tract has better defense mechanisms against inhaled particles because of mucociliary clearance and things like that, and they're more easily cleared. So I think that's absolutely part of it. So that's just that that has to do with deposition pattern and the size drives the deposition pattern and it happens to be better protected. But there, there may be a part of that that's tissue tropism too. And so you know, some of these viruses may not infect as well on the respiratory epithelium in the upper respiratory tract. It'll depend on the location of the receptor. So that's ACE2, right? And it, and it may be on, on the surface or the apical side of, of the respiratory epithelium, but it may be on the basal lateral side. So maybe it's not as accessible. There's things like that to consider as well. Um, and, and yeah, I don't have a great answer as to what's going on with the 
um, difference in particle size in terms of the mechanism that's driving that, but that's something we're interested in looking at a little bit. And we're actually trying to set up some organ on a chip with respiratory epithelia um, where we can have an upper and a lower respiratory epithelium and we can deposit and start to look at some of those things potentially. Thanks, Dr. Dabish. Um, we have another question from Tom who asks, how might the aerosol population existing in the exhale region influence the results of your study? Could you read that again? I wasn't, I didn't hear all of that and I don't yes. see where you're at in the chat. Uh, how might the aerosol population existing in the exhale region influence the results of your study? I'm not exactly sure what's being asked there, I guess, to be honest. Tom, would you want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask directly? If not, we can move on to another question. Um, Daniel asks, um, well, Daniel says, thank you very much for the great talk. You stated that infectivity loss occurs during evap evaporation. Would this also suggest the reverse when it comes to condensation? If so, would sampling using a condensation sampling technology aid in infectious aerosol sampling compared to filter collection when sampling in the field for culturable virus. So just to uh, repeat, the first part of that question is, would this also suggest the reverse when it comes to condensation? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, in, in our experience with sampling with other viruses and things, um, it depends on the, you know, sampling duration, collecting onto a filter, especially if you're worried about infectivity or viability, depending on whether it's a virus or bacteria, um, filter samplers do seem to be more detrimental over longer sampling periods than, um, than, than maybe a, a liquid or a condensation collector. Um, that being said, we did publish a paper. Um, my colleague, Shauna Retnis, our shoemate was the first author on it. Um, where she looked at a bunch of different samplers and, and there were, you know, some effects of, we didn't look at condensation collectors, but we looked at, you know, liquid impingers where the particles are uh, collected straight into liquid. And there were some, there were some issues there too. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the ideal sampler would be. Um, so, but yeah, I don't know. Condensation could work better. I know other people are using it to collect exhaled breath and things, and it seems to work just fine. Mm. Okay, for our next question, it's from Claire Morris, and uh, this is in the media. You're using in the media you're using for the aerosol transmissibility work at the beginning of the talk. Do you think there is a way to try and incorporate effects of lung fluid, mucins, etc., on infectivity? Yeah, so that that's something. So when I talked about equilibrated aerosols, so we did quite a bit of work on on incorporating you know the virus into simulated saliva and also simulated we call it respiratory tract lining fluid with a composition more closely mimics that of the uh, respiratory tract and compared that to sort of media and you know in those studies you know there, there's some small effects but there aren't huge differences in the stability driven by the media you know you can pick up some small effects under some conditions and things like that um, we, we could repeat that in, in this case you know we didn't we didn't have you know, resources available to do that part. So this was just in culture media. Um, but in terms of physical properties, at least, you know, culture media is, you know, pretty close to, you know, saliva and some other things. So I, I can't imagine it would be too far off, but yeah, that would be, it would be good to have that data to, to make that point. And I don't really have that data. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Dabish. Um, the next question was similar to Claire, so I'll uh, jump over that. Um, and Richard said, would the presence of the fluids the virus is contained in during infection play a role, mucus, antibodies, et cetera? Yeah, so I assume, yeah, Rich is, is, is meaning 
like the fluids the virus is contained in dur during infection. So that you mean the composition of the aerosol particle itself and its ability to penetrate the mucus um, or be attacked by antibodies, I guess. Yeah, maybe I, yeah, again, I don't, I don't know of any studies that show that it does or it doesn't, but yeah, the, the physical chemical properties of that particle when it lands on the mucus may affect its ability to penetrate that mucus and get to the respiratory epithelium. So for large particles, yeah, potentially there, there could be an effect there. Um, and so, I mean, that again, to the previous question as well, that kind of points to the importance of trying to mimic the composition of these particles as close as you can to the respiratory, to what you would expect in the case of respiratory transmission, which, you know, it isn't, isn't always an easy, uh, easy thing to do, I, I think. But yeah, no, but it's a good point. All right, and then we have the final question uh, of the day for the time that's allowed, and that's going to be from Ch Chantal. And uh, this question is that larger particles tend to be generated in the upper airway, while small particles are generated deeper in the lung. Could this influence the concentration of virus in the exhaled droplets and as such affect the risk of infection when inhaled? Yeah, so good, good point. Um, I do not have a good answer to that. So, you know, in order to answer that, what we would want to see is, you know, nasal swabs or some sort of sample from the upper, upper respiratory of an infected person at the same time that we got a sample from the lower respiratory. So bronco, bronco alveolar lavage, and you could, you could do this in an animal model probably um, to begin to answer this, but I don't know of, and I have looked for this to see if they are, if, if there are paired data and there's a little bit of data out there, but I haven't been able to find, um, to find a whole lot. Um, the, the one, the one interesting piece of data that I do know of that sort of tangentially relates to this is there was a study done where they measured the viral load via PCR in the exhaled breath of a bunch of COVID infected patients. And they did this on, you know, 70 or 80 different occasions. So this isn't an N of one or two. So they actually had, you know, pretty good statistical power here. Um, and they compared the amount of viral RNA that they detected um, in those exhaled breath samples. So this was just during quiet breathing. They weren't having them talk or anything. They compared that to the amount that they picked up in the nasal swab. Um, and, and those two things do not correlate at all, um, which is, you know, I guess to, to your point about where the particles are coming from, those larger or the, the nasal swab would tend to represent larger particles that are generated during coughing potentially, whereas during normal breathing, the small particles coming out of the lung are coming from the, the, deep, the deep lung. And so the amounts present in those particles versus the upper respiratory, you know, there's no correlation between those two things, which suggests they're different which to your point, you know, that could absolutely affect the concentration of the virus and those exhaled drops and the risk downstream from any of that. But yeah, I don't have good quantitative data on how different those two things are. Thank you so much, Dr. Davish, for your time. And I know we went a bit over, so thank you everyone for sticking around. And now we will hand it back to Amy to wrap up. Thank you again. Well, hi. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for a great session. That was a really great talk. And thank you to our um, moderators um, and all of you for joining us. And so we'll uh, see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Amy, as the host, would you like me to end the meeting or kind of wait for everyone to dwindle off? Um, I think we're good to go ahead and end the meeting. So thanks. <laughs>
Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Davish. I hope you both have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks. Take care.